Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. This uh, summer, I'm cheating a little bit in this series about King David. I don't choose the readings for this series. This comes from something called the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a set of Bible readings assigned and agreed upon by the majority of churches in the world. They're assembled by scholars and church leaders from a variety of Christian denominations, and they're meant to tell a specific story about God from a particular perspective. The lectionary is one way for churches to be in unity if we're all hearing the same Bible passages in worship, but we don't usually follow this pattern here at First Lutheran. In a traditional form, the lectionary usually has four Bible passages to be read on Sunday, an Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures passage, a psalm or part of a psalm, a passage from one of the the letters of Paul or James or whomever, and a reading from a gospel. But during the summer, things shift a little bit. We get to choose between the two Old Testament readings. One Old Testament reading has a connection to the other three, usually the gospel, and the other, which is called the semi-continuous reading, follows one story from June into September. And what I'm preaching on in this series is the semi-continuous readings that follow David's rise and his reign over King of Israel. I tell you this inside baseball stuff, mainly because I'm a little miffed at today's reading that you just heard. The juicy part is missing. And not just the juicy part, but the part that pulls this whole story together, putting not only David's story in context, but it it explains a vital moment in Israel's history. The scholars and church leaders that assembled the lectionary must have thought that David looked really bad if verses six to eight were included, if the preacher was either too lazy to explain what's happening within the story and the ramification this has for Israel's history, or if the preacher was just gonna preach on other assigned readings, leaving this just as sit as it is. You heard what the lectionary folks wanted you to hear. Now you'll hear what's really in this passage. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David in Hebron and said, look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd over my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. So far so good, you heard that part. David is finally crowned king of Israel, establishing himself first in Hebron, and then over to what is called the United Monarchy as the kingdom of Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north unite under him. Side note, there's Israel in the north, there's Israel, and then there's Israel. The folks, the tribes of Israel, they were just a uh, one side to the whole Israel, they skipped the name, but when they united, they were all called Israel, just to confuse you. Because the tribes of Israel in the north, had up to this moment been loyal to Saul, who we heard about last week, and his successor Ishboseth, both of whom hated David. So this is no small incident with what you just heard. The people of God were up to that point divided between Saul's people in the north and David's people in the south. When King Ishboseth, Saul's successor, that Judah rejected, or David's people rejected, when he got assassinated, a power vacuum appeared, leaving Saul's people vulnerable to attack. And so Saul's people, calling themselves Israel, approached David to unite under him and finally have a united kingdom. That's what was happening here. The tribes of Israel, here's the thing, they make no condition on this offer with David. They come almost begging with their hands out. That's because when King Ishboseth died, along with Abner, who was Saul's army captain and the king's second in command, when he died, all their bargaining power was lost. 
that they knew who David was and that he valued human connection. And so they appealed to their shared humanity. They say, look, we are your bone and flesh. This was their way of saying, we have a common ancestry. We are family. There's no earthly reason why we should be opposed to one another. Then they appeal to his ego. They point out that it wasn't King Saul who defeated the enemy, it was David. It was you who led Israel and brought them in. You were our king all along. Saul may have had the crown, but it was you that the people looked to. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You who shall be ruler over Israel, big Israel. So this wasn't a strategic political decision made to strengthen their power. This was a divine decree. This held the weight of God's commandment. And God's words were subtle. They were a stinging indictment of Israel's first king. David, this shepherd boy who slew the Philistine Goliath, is now the shepherd king. This king will lead his people the way a good shepherd leads the sheep, as one who loves and cares for the sheep and wants to see each one of them grow and thrive. Unlike the bad shepherd, <coughs> Saul, who uses the sheep only for personal financial gain and gives the sheep the bare minimum to survive to keep expenses low. So folks saw the contrast between King David and King Saul. King Saul was the selfish brute who ruled by force, and King David was the sensitive poet who governed by love and care for his people. And that's why when the elders gathered in Hebron to anoint David as shepherd over all Israel, they avoided the word king. While the translation we heard uses that word because it's easier, the translation that we read for the word King, they, they, the word is neged. Neged, while not having a direct English translation, is closer to the word prince. If they wanted to name David specifically as king, they would have called him Melech. The elders didn't want Saul's baggage weighing David down. Also, that's not who David was. He was the shepherd of the people leading them with kindness and gentleness. He wasn't the king, governing by command and control. Also, David and the elders wanted to honor God as sovereign, not any human authority. David was God's chosen ruler called to shepherd Israel, uniting the people in one house. But there was a problem, those pesky Jebusites. They still occupied the holy city of Jerusalem that God promised to Israel centuries later. Joshua tried to kick them out gen generations earlier, but he was sent packing. So how will the United Kingdom of Israel take back Jerusalem? Here's the part you missed. And here's where it gets really interesting. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here. Even the blind and the lame will turn you back, thinking David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. David had said on that day, whoever would strike down the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, those whom David hates. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into this house. Juicy parts. There's some important information there, hey? David took Jerusalem by force. The Jebusites had been living in Jerusalem for centuries. As I said, Joshua, generations earlier, tried to dislodge them and he failed miserably. The Jebusites were arrogant and they had reason to be. They beat back all their invaders for centuries. For all they knew, Jerusalem was their city. And who was David to attack them? Really, David? Israel just got pummeled by the Philistines. David was a young, king, a young kid, overextending his reach as a newly crowned king. If he took one step into Jerusalem, he was gonna get creamed. 
the Jebusites had no reason to be afraid. David's not going to come in here. He's weak. He has no backup. If he attacks us, he's finished as king. He's not dumb enough to attack Jerusalem. That's why these guys are so cocky. They said, our blind and lame can beat these guys. You know, trash talk. But the thing is, the Jebusites had a legitimate claim on Jerusalem. They'd been there a long time, well before Israel had designs on it. Israel may think it's their holy city, but there's no reason why the Jebusites would obey the command of a God they didn't know. How David conquered Jerusalem and kicked out the Jebusites, the Bible doesn't tell, nor does archaeology. One theory that was popular for centuries because of an offhand comment in verse 8 of our passage was that David's army snuck in through the water shaft and launched a surprise attack. But archaeological evidence has recently shown that this would have been impossible since the discovery of heavy, heavy, heavy fortifications around the water shafts and they could not launch a sneak attack. But no matter how David took back Jerusalem, the defeated Jebusites still had strong hold on the memory and imagination of people in the region. A memory and imagination that endures to this day. The Jebusites have been a source of inspiration for modern day Palestinians. And you can probably see why. While there's no archeological evidence or historical line drawn directly from the Jebusites residing in Jerusalem and today's Palestinians who claim the city for themselves, Yasser Arafat and other Arab Palestinians have declared Jebusite lineage to argue that Palestinians were there first since uh, they, their claim precedes the Jewish claim. Since scripture clearly says that the Jebusites were there for centuries before. In fact, the book of First Chronicle names Jerusalem as Jebus, strengthening the Palestinian argument. While the line from Jebusite to Palestinian is a dubious one, and we certainly won't litigate the case today. But for me, it shows me just how alive these stories are. But so now, David takes hold of the holy city, and he names it after himself. This part ends by saying, David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around the Milo onwards or inwards. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. This was a massive shift. Their identity now was as much political as it was religious. The shift of Israel's religious imagination from the study of scripture to an embodied hope in King David was where Israel became a political force in that region. And David, the virtuous shepherd poet who ascended to Israel's throne, would be confronted with the complexities of being a superpower. And now with David occupying Jerusalem, an old story ends, a new story emerges. A new kingdom has been born, because now is the time for Israel to dream. Since David is the embodiment of Israel's hope and God's vision for them as a people. Where the old Jerusalem mocked the blind and the lame, Israel includes them in the life of the community. The old Jerusalem didn't know God's name. The new Jerusalem has become a house, a house of prayer for all people. This was a defining moment for Israel, a moment where they arrived at the doorway of immense possibility for their future, where they could stand united, proclaiming the love and the freedom and the mercy of God who brought them together under a common banner in a land that had been promised to them. And they would finally become the people that God had called them to be. Today, at the waters of baptism, we too stand at that same doorway. A new day has emerged for Eleanor. These waters proclaim a defining moment for her. 
where she is received into God's family. And also, these waters are an entry into the beautiful future that God has for her and that God has for the world. As she is received into Christ's church in holy baptism, Eleanor embodies the same hope that David did. That's because each one of us whom God calls by name is not just a messenger of hope, but a living, breathing realization of the hope that God has given the world. Each time we return to these waters, we are reminded who we are. We are reminded that we who have inherited David's hope as our hope are a people who look to the future with trust that something new and beautiful is emerging despite what our present world may look like. In these waters that have been poured out for you, you are remember, reminded that God resides in you. You are reminded that you are Jerusalem. You are the holy city. You are God's promise of love and freedom. Jesus has conquered the Jebusites of sin and death so that God will reside in you. So as you move through your life, in all your wrong turns and your sudden stops, in all your unexpected and uninvited side trips, in all your bad decisions and impulsive choices, your destination remains the same. And the promise of a new and better world endures because the story that God is telling in you and through you is a story of hope. It's a story of truth of peace, of mercy, of forgiveness, of justice, and especially of love. That is the promise that God made to David and through David. And that's the promise that God is fulfilling in Eleanor today. And the promise that God is fulfilling in you. And may the Spirit give us strength, guidance, and joy to fulfill the promise that resides in each one of us. For you are the holy city. You are the beacon of light. Amen.